hand. And one of our esteemed ushers will get that handout to you. We'd love for you to be able to take notes this morning as we look at Outcast Jesus, the friend of sinners. Luke chapter number 17. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can look in your notes. Luke chapter number 17, and we're going to read verses 12 through 19. Luke chapter number 17, beginning in verse number 12. The Bible says, And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourself unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise and go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. It's really an illustration of thankfulness. Ten men who were lepers, one was healed, and only one returned to speak to the Lord and to thank him. And we find that it is this one man who received much more than physical healing. He received spiritual restoration. And this morning we're looking at how uh, a couple reminders on uh, how we as physical outcasts can get plugged into what God has for us. Let's start with a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, you have been so good to us. And just by the fact that we woke up this morning and we drew that breath of fresh air, we could look at our, see our children, our spouse and in our home and Lord, you've been so good to us, and so many times we forget to be thankful. Now, Lord, I know that there are people in here today, perhaps, that struggle physically with some kind of ailment. Lord, every one of us grow old, and as we grow old, it becomes a little bit more difficult to do the things we've always done. Lord, there might be someone in here today that is struggling through some kind of physical problem that believes that they've been put on the shelf by you and they can't be used by you and there's really not a need to serve you anymore. Lord, I, I pray that through this message, those who feel as if they're outcasts because of their physical issues will see that you are a God that transcends our physical issues. And that, God, you are the God who can use us despite how we feel. Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that you will work within their hearts and show them the need to turn to you. In your name we pray. Amen. We've been looking at the story of outcasts. And you can see in your notes the definition of an outcast. An outcast is someone who is considered to be different or outside what is popular or acceptable. An outcast is someone who is outside of what is considered popular or acceptable. Now, uh, we should all start on the same baseline that it's not important for you to be popular in life. Uh, it's not important for you to fit in with everybody else. In fact, it seems as if there are many people who consider themselves outcasts who will do anything just to be part of a group and just to be part of a clique. Uh, but we can look within our own hearts and realize that every one of us perhaps have uh, felt like an outcast, someone who maybe just doesn't quite fit in. Maybe you weren't the popular guy in your school. Uh, maybe you weren't accepted by all the girls when, uh, when you went to school. And you can feel like you're an outcast. And we're looking at the Bible to see people who would be considered outcasts from their society and how God treated them. In fact, we find that God was a friend to these people. And in our passage here today, we're looking at not only a person that was an outcast, but a man who, a, a, a group of men who had leprosy. Now, um, you know, I like to show pictures to illustrate uh, what we're talking about. And I'm going to spare you the pictures illustrating leprosy here this morning. You can go Google it. When you get home and realize that leprosy is a terrible, 
terrible disease. In fact, it was a disease that was considered to be the disease of the poor. So only, uh, we talked last week about the poor being the outcast of society. This was a disease that, was, that made them a sub-outcast of even the outcast. They were, uh, uh, it caused a great uh, severe disfiguring sores and nerve damage in the arms and the legs. And uh, you'll find that uh, uh, in the Bible, as well as in just modern day society, that they can turn white and their limbs will fall off. These lepers were people who were uh, marginalized by society. Uh, they lived in colonies away from everybody else. This disease that was called for uh, this, uh, this a disease that was uh, considered to be the poor man's disease was something that kept people from polite society. They were marginalized. In fact, uh, when normal people would come around a leper, you know what a leper was to do? They were to cry out that they uh, were unclean, that they had this disease. Now today that would be maybe considered some kind of uh, HIPAA violation, right? If you were to walk around and like scream out, your disease or your deformity. But at this time, the, the, these, these people were so, so outcast and so marginalized uh, from their society that they had to walk around and yell out the very disease that marginalized them. Not only were they marginalized, but they were cast out by their family. If someone within the family were to have this disease, they were removed from the family, taken to a colony, and their names stricken from the record of even being a family member. It was not the disease that you would want to have. They were outcasts in their family. They were considered useless by society. Now, uh, many times when people had uh, leprosy, it was considered uh, divine judgment being pronounced upon them. And uh, if that, this person had leprosy and they couldn't be around polite society, they couldn't be around all the in crowd, if you will, uh, they were completely useless to anyone. That's why they went to these colonies. We also see that they were outcast, uh, that they were defined, their very life was defined by their disease. Do you know people today who maybe are defined by the disease that they have? They're so perhaps caught up, and, and I don't want it to sound in a bad way, but they're just so consumed with the disease that they have, that it becomes their identity. It becomes the thing that always comes up in conversation. It be, within just a few minutes of talking to a person that maybe has a problem, they have to let everybody know what their problem is. While we're looking at lepers today, we're going to see that there are other passages in Scripture of people who, were, who, who had great ailments, who were blind and people that had leprosy. And, and we see that Jesus was a friend of those who were physically unable to take care of themselves. Jesus was a friend of those who had incurable diseases. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus was sent to this earth to not only redeem mankind from their sins, but also to heal those who were broken. One last thing I want you to see before we move on is this man not only was, uh, was an outcast, and not only was he a leper, but he was also a Samaritan. And being a Samaritan meant you were uh, definitely an outcast in Jewish society. The Samaritans, as you can see in your notes, uh, were a mixed race. Uh, they were mixed race Jews from the Babylonian captivity. Uh, they remained in Israel when the others were carried off into captivity. And those that remained then married Babylonians that, uh, that stayed in, in Israel. And they, uh, they mixed their religions. They worshipped the one true God. And then they also mixed it with, uh, with worshipping tribal gods of the Babylonians. And when the exile ended, when those Israelites that were in Babylon returned to the homeland, uh, these Samaritans actually fought against them returning to their homeland. And now in Jesus' time, this is 700 years after that happened, people at that time had this amazing bias for anyone who was a Samaritan. In fact, they would, they would go out of their way to walk around Samaria, the place where they were found. 
uh, they would not intermingle with the Samaritans. They would have nothing to do with the Samaritans. And it was this person, out, out of the ten, there's one person who was this marginalized outcast that we see God did, that God did a great work in. And really, what I, the point that I want us all to get uh, this morning is that Jesus can heal those who are sick, and that Jesus can use you even if you are sick. Now, I have a meme up here that I found, um, because it's to illustrate that sometimes as we get older, we feel like we are way worse than we were when we were younger. This guy says, Mozart wrote his first symphony at the age of eight, and I'm an adult just rehearsing what I'm going to say in the drive through five times. Uh, how many of you feel like you maybe have a mental ailment like this guy? It's like, you, and, and I don't know what the problem is with my voice, but pretty much every time I go through a drive through um, I, I like pickles, and so I always order extra pickles. And when I go through a drive through inevitably there will be something messed up on my order. They'll add, they'll put no mustard on there. There'll be no ketchup or something. It's, I, there was a point where I would get upset about it, but I'm to the point now where I'm just interested to find out what they actually heard and what I actually get. <laughs> but this guy, you know, he, he said, yeah, Mozart was able to write a symphony at the age of eight, and here I am, I'm just having to rehearse what in the world I'm going to say. How many of you feel like that sometimes? We all maybe have these uh, feelings of just getting old. Um, when I, I, a few years ago, I had a, I had a, a, a problem with, uh, when I ate fat, my, my gallbladder hurt. And I don't know if you've ever experienced gallbladder pain. I know uh, we have a few that have. But it's a terrible, terrible pain. And I suffered through the pain of, you know, for months before ever getting, getting it addressed. Um, and finally, I think my wife had made guacamole the night before, and I um, ate a lot of guacamole. And I stood up, I had to stand up the entire night um, because I hurt so bad. And then the next morning, I stood up for another five hours just writhing in pain until finally I asked my wife to take me to the hospital and get me taken care of. And uh, they, they, they gave me morphine, and they gave me more morphine, and they gave me more morphine. It was just, it was just a really bad... I wasn't asking for it, folks. It, <laughs> it, I just was really that bad off. And, um, and what should have been like an outpatient procedure ended up uh, sending me to the hospital for three days. Now, um, now, ladies, I have read blogs about women who have had gallbladder uh, uh, pain, and they have said that gallbladder pain is worse than childbirth. So, women, I want you to know that I know what you have gone through. <laughs> I have felt it. I've felt the pain myself. But I asked the doctor, you know, why is it that my gallbladder just quit working? And he said, that's what happens when you get old. Sometimes things just quit working. And it made no sense to me why, why a body part would just quit working, but it did. And I know as we get older and maybe as we kind of cross the 40 threshold and into our midlife, uh, we start seeing things not working as well as they should. Uh, we start waking up and there are pains that we had not had in the past. And really what it does is it maybe reminds us of our, uh, uh, of getting old and of, uh, you know, how things kind of progress through life. And what I really want us to understand, while you, none of you have leprosy that I know of, if you do, please yell out unclean, <laughs> you do have some kind of physical ailment. And there are people, even in this room, who served God and we're excited about serving God who were faithful to church and faithful to a ministry. And as soon as a problem hit, they deflated. As soon as a problem, a physical ailment came in, it's like it suddenly consumed their life. They realized, well, you know, maybe this serving God thing is not all it's cracked up to be. Or maybe I need to go ahead and spend uh, uh, 40 hours a week just nursing my ailment and really i just want to encourage you that god is not done with you let me show you a couple things here before we dismiss some reminders for those who are physically outcast you got your notes turn to your first page i want to show you the first thing is that there is no health concern uh, no health concern is terminal in god's economy no health concern is terminal in god's economy as soon as my gallbladder 
quit working, I started figuring out other things were going to quit working soon. In, in fact, uh, over Christmas break, I, we drove up to Gatlinburg, which is a 22-hour drive. Um, and it's a drive we've made a lot. We go up there, stay at a cabin with family, and um, have a good time. And uh, normally, a 22- or 24-hour drive I can do, and it's not really a problem. Well, this time, when I drove my 22-hour drive up to Gatlinburg, um, I started experiencing this pain in my chest. And, um, a and, you know, I started thinking, you know what? I'm 39 years old. I have, a I have pain in my chest. My gallbladder just died a couple months, uh, years ago. Maybe my heart's getting ready to die. And so I called my mom, and my mom's an RN, and she's worked in hospitals for many, many years. And I called her to maybe get some encouragement. I said, Mom, uh, I'm laying in bed. It's very difficult for me to breathe. And, um, and I'm not sure exactly what I should do. She said, uh, and I said, you know, it's, it, it's been hurting for several days, so it can't be a heart attack. She said, oh, yeah, it, it, it can be a heart attack. You can have those pains for, for days, even weeks, before the massive one hits you. And I, <laughs> and I said, well, uh, I said, well, this, you know, I'm 39. Do you think that it might be a heart attack? She, she, she started listing and cataloging all the family members that have died in their 30s due to heart problems. My mom's not here today, uh, but you need to give her a hard time about that because I went to the emergency room. And uh, the doctor that, that saw me, they did everything. I was there for like four hours, and the doctor that saw me was about my age. And after being there for four hours, he, he looked at me and he said, you know, um, you're pretty young, so I'm pretty sure it's not a heart attack. But we've run all these tests, and your heart looks just fine. So you're probably just experiencing like some cartilage, like muscle things as you're turning the wheel. But you know what made me feel good about that? Is that doctor said I was pretty young. <laughs> because in my mind, I, my gallbladder died. Uh, my, uh, I went to Washington, D.C. and walked seven miles around. I worked up there in Reston for a couple months. And I went to D.C. I walked everywhere I could possibly walk. And toward the end of that, my, both my knees were hurting so badly that I couldn't, I, it was hard for me to get back on the train. And ever since that time, my knees hurt. I don't, I'm just thinking that my body is falling apart. I'm trying to be transparent with you because your body's probably, you probably feel these same things, right? Or is it just me? Okay. Maybe it is just me. But understand that there's no health concern that is terminal in God's economy. These 10 men... When they went to the, if you will, doctor and got the news that they had leprosy, looked at it as a terminal illness. It was an illness that was to separate them from their family, from their society, from their friends, and was to isolate them with others who were outcasts. And I don't know how long these men spent having leprosy, but really it doesn't matter because God is not bound by time or space. If perhaps their nose fell off or a digit fell off, their foot fell off, God is completely capable of restoring that because God is not bound by terminal illness. He, there might be a terminal problem, but God is not bound by that. You see in your first note, uh, first note that he can supernaturally restore us. In Luke chapter 5, it uh, tells the story about another leper. It says, and it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, perhaps this man was in really bad shape, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Do you hear the pain in this man's voice? If you just will, I can be made clean. Verse 13, and he put forth his hand and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Now, there are times where God works in a supernatural way to restore our health, because no health concern that we can experience is terminal in God's economy. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we see a, a, a man named Naaman. He was the general of the Syrian army, and he had leprosy. And because of his faith, he dipped in the, in the, in the muddy Jordan uh, seven times. He came up and he was healed of his leprosy. I, I, I just bring that up because God can supernaturally restore that thing that preoccupies you. But you can see in the second point that sometimes he can let life just take its course. 
Hebrew children, uh, Meshach and Abednego, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter number 3 were standing before the king. The king said, you did not bow, and so you're going to burn. And this was their response in Daniel 3, verse 17. If it be so, O God, whom we, uh, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. There's no stopping point for God. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But look at verse 18. But if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And notice they said, God can deliver us, but if he's not, we're not backing down. We're going to stand where we stand. We're going to keep on following our God in obedience. God can supernaturally restore you, but there are times where God allows life to take its course, which gets us to point number two. Perfect health is not God's end game for your life. Perfect health is not God's end game. Ten lepers, nine lepers felt perhaps that it was God's end game. If I could just get healed of my leprosy, then my life will be so much better. I'll be restored to my family. Um, I'll be able to have all my fingers and all my toes. I'll be able to go back to work. I'll be part of a community again. The average lifespan in Rome at that time was in the early 40s. So if you survived infancy, you would die 42, 43 years old. I don't know how old these men were, but it could be that these men were, rest- would they, they had their health restored, they were no longer lepers, and just 10 years later died. Dying healthy, you can see in your notes, is not God's purpose for my life. There's a gentleman in Houston that writes really nice, shiny, flashy books about how you can have your best life now. But what if your life now is not as good as it was when you had a gallbladder? What if your life is not as good as it was when you had your full strength and your heart was just fine? Uh, There are times where uh, where our health will degrade, and that doesn't mean that God is putting you on a shelf. It doesn't mean that God can't use you. We just have to understand that uh, it's part of growing old. And perfect health is not God's end game. Let me show you a couple things. Number one, remember that my aches remind me that I woke up with a purpose. When you wake up and your back is sore, remember that God gave you another life. And it's not just a life to exist. It's a life to serve Him with purpose. Look at this, Psalm 17, 15. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. There's nothing like waking up in the morning and and, uh, opening your eyes and, and seeing a fresh new day and knowing that God is ahead of the day and He has everything under control. Sometimes we get so concerned that we are missing a digit, having a problem, that we wake up without perfect health and we say, oh God, you've given me another day of torture. And God's really given us another day of purpose. His compassions fail not. Look at this. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What an amazing thought that, that every morning God's compassions are fresh. I don't know how many of you are morning people, uh, but there are people in my home who are not morning people, um, and it's my wife. I love my wife. I'm, I didn't mean to point her out. It's my kids. Uh, I, when I wake up, I'm like, I'm pretty, pretty energetic, and uh, my wife doesn't, it takes like a couple things of coffee uh, to get her up to like my energy level. And sometimes when we wake up like that, we think, oh, man, it's just another day. Um, But wake up, uh, I think I just used my wife in a negative example. Sorry, sweetheart. That was, I was going someplace else with that, and I forgot where I was going. See, that's where I'm supposed to write down my illustrations. But my aches remind me (laughs) that I woke up on purpose. Every morning, his compassions fail not. Number two. My aches remind me of the real life to come. Look at this passage in 2 Corinthians 5. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Your tabernacle is your body, okay? 
For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, not that we could get rid of our body, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Your ache and my ache today should remind us every morning when we fall out of bed, when we have to put that thing on, when we have to do this thing to try to just get by, should point to the real life that one day we will have. The the life that you experience today is nothing, nothing like the life you will experience forever in heaven with a perfect body. No body parts will, will, will degrade. And nothing will fall off. You'll be in perfect health for eternity. And whenever we look at ourselves and we face all the problems and the aches and the pains that we have, understand that this is not the end game. One day, a perfect body we will be in and we'll be able to glorify God in all of his righteousness with our full capacity. But my aches remind me of the real life that is to come. But thirdly, I want to I want to show you not only uh, does no health concern, uh, no health concern is terminal and not only is uh, perfect health not God's end game. But let me show you number three and we'll be done. My health doesn't determine my usefulness. My health doesn't determine my usefulness. I can still make a difference regardless of how I feel. You realize if you're here today that God has a purpose and a plan. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your disability. God has a purpose. Too many times... Christians get disengaged when the shoulder starts hurting. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and dig ditches for the church. It just means you get retooled and reused in some other way. Sometimes when Christians start going through the struggles, the emotional and the psychological struggles of having grown kids and having grandkids and dealing with all of the different interpersonal uh, uh, issues that can go on with that, sometimes uh, grandparents will pull back and say, look, I can't be useful anymore. Everybody just looks at me like I'm just a, a person that can't be used. But you do have a purpose and you can be used for the glory of God. I'm useful to God despite my aches. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number nine. I returned and saw to the son that the race is not to the swift. You tell this to your kids. Nor the battle to the strong, nor yet the bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. Sometimes as we, as we grow older, it's not that God is putting us on a shelf. He wants us to get retooled and used in a different way. One thing that young kids, is James here? Uh, James would be my illustration if he's in the overflow room. Uh, he would be one of those guys that if you told him to chop down a tree, he would take a stick and hit that stick a million times until the tree fell down. He'd, be, he'd have all the energy in the world to do that. But as we get older, we get wiser in how we approach problems. And God simply, whenever we have those aches and pains, he's not removing us from the Christian walk. He's not saying that we have nothing to contribute to the Christian life. He's simply saying it's time to get retooled. It's time to work in a different way. Last thing I want you to see is that I can realize the truths of the Bible in a more meaningful way. The Bible says in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. When you have all the strength in the world and you have all your body parts working the way they should, you can become extremely dependent upon your will and your ability. Uh, your ability to take care of the situation, to conquer the mountain, to drive uh, yourself into a success, you can be, become dependent upon those things. But whenever we start ex- slowing down and experiencing these pains and these problems, we simply can realize even more that it is God who gives us the strength. And we're able to be strong in His power and in His might. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul, who was a man that was used greatly by God, said this, Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Look at this. 
For when I am weak, then am I strong. In my weakest moment, physically, emotionally, psychologically, I am strong spiritually in His power and in His might. These ten lepers, nine of them, were restored physically. Uh, The Bible says that Jesus told them to go and present themselves to the synagogue before the priest and get a clean bill of health and then be restored to society. But there was one man, one man who realized that physical restoration wasn't the end game. And the Bible says, look back in, in, in Luke chapter 17. He says in Luke 17, verse 19, And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Wouldn't it be sad if a Christian is more consumed with their physical problems than they are about spiritual issues? Wouldn't it be sad if maybe there's a person in this room who who believed in God but decided to pull away from God because their prayers of a perfect body were not answered. God hit them with an ailment, and surely that means that God isn't in control. Wouldn't it be sad if there's somebody here today that is searching and seeking and looking for uh, a relationship with Christ, and they pull back because they see that Christians aren't perfect? Wouldn't it be sad if we all just deal with the physical I'm not sure where you stand here today, but God can use you despite your physical ailments. In fact, in your weakest moments is when he is the strongest. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want you to know that God has a purpose and a plan for you exactly where you are today. And if you're here today and maybe you're struggling through physical problems and you'd say, Brother David, I've pulled back a bit, but by God's grace, I'll push forward for him. Would you raise your hand here this morning? God, I have physical issues, but God, with your strength and your help, I will push forward. Amen. I see those hands. Maybe you're here today and you're questioning why God allowed this problem to happen. God, why is it that I'm different than all my other family? Why is it that I have to struggle with this and no one else does? Why is it that it seems like everybody else fits in and I just don't fit in? Maybe you've become bitter and disheartened and discouraged. Can I tell you that God is not done using you? And you might not have all the perfect parts, but God can still use you in a strong and a mighty way. If you're here today and say, Brother David, I'm struggling with something and I just need God to help me get through this. Would you raise your hand here this morning? I see those hands. In just a moment, we're going to stand to our feet. And I want to give you a moment to get in front of God and ask God to give you the strength and the power that you need to get through this. And to pray and ask God to help you to be used in this stage of life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed as we stand to our feet. Dear Lord, there's not a person in this room that's not struggling with some kind of physical problem. There's not a person in this room that doesn't look at somebody else and say, I wish that I had their physical strength. I wish I could do what they do. God, I could be so much more valuable if I had this. But God, You've created us just the way you've made us. And you've given us a purpose in life just by virtue of the fact that we wake up every morning. And God, I pray that first you'll help us to be thankful for where we are today. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to get over any kind of bitterness or any kind of concern and just focus on how you can use us even where we stand today. Lord, these lepers, they, nine of them were okay with getting healed physically. The one wanted to be healed, restored spiritually. And Lord, if there's someone here today that has 
never come to know you as Savior. They've never had that relationship with you. God, I pray that you'll work upon their hearts even this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. As the piano plays and heads are bowed and eyes are closed, this is the time to make a decision for the Lord. for your attention. If you would have a seat and let me give you a few announcements and we'll be dismissed. Um, first, remember that we're having our baptism service Sunday, April 30th. Uh, we're pulling out the big baptistry. We'll have it out front here um, and we'll be baptizing a lot of folks. If you need to be baptized, please give it with my wife so that she can put you on the list. Don't forget about that. Um, and we have a bunch of other announcements. Read through uh, the, hand, uh, read through the um, handout this morning so that you're up to date with everything that's going on but we do have another video announcement here so tim if we could roll with that hey it's steven with calvary baptist church and academy's amazing grace 5k family fun run through land of park race day is rapidly approaching so if you have not signed up yet please go ahead and do so at the link above this video a couple things about the race first of all the race can be done at any pace you like Secondly, if the date, time, or location doesn't work for you, you can do what's called a virtual race, which means you'd run the race anytime, anywhere, at your convenience, but still get the t-shirt, still get the finisher's medal, and still get to support this great cause. Also, please invite your friends, family, and coworkers to join you in signing up for this 5K. The more people we have, the merrier, and plus, the better we can support the cause we're supporting. Every participant will be receiving an event t-shirt, as well as a finisher's medal when they cross that finish line. There will be a silent auction at the race, so please come prepared for that. If there's any other details you'd like, you can visit the website above, or you can just go to www.cbctexas.org race. We also are in need of volunteers, so if for some reason you cannot do the race and would like to volunteer, please contact me and we'll get you plugged in. Thank you very much, and we'll look forward to seeing you on race day. It's gone viral, I'm sure cbctexas.org slash race to find out more information on that. If you're a guest with us, make sure to stop to see my wife and I. We'll be at the back entrance. We'd love to uh, get to know you, so make sure to stop and see us. Robert? Thank you, David. Would you join us as we stand? Choir practice tonight at 5 o'clock. Choir practice tonight at 5 o'clock. Those of you who are interested in wondering who we chose for the uh, Christmas drama, that will be announced within the next couple weeks once uh, Madam Spielberg returns from her cruise. <laughs> All right. All right. So... For our benediction, we're going to sing the chorus um, and ending of Days of Elijah. Let's try that again. Let's try that intro again. Sorry, this is a new thing. There we go. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining.